All my restorative justice folks say, ow. All right, everybody in the room. That's for all y'all who was under 40, you know. I'm not going to, part of the title of this presentation is keeping it real. I'm not sure what that is, other than the fact that here I am navigating three microphones. <laughs> one on my left, one on my right, and one right here on my lapel. I'm not sure which one works, but we're going to use them all until it makes sense. But I, 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 I'm, I, I would be not keeping it real if I didn't tell you that up until the great introduction by Brother Morris, I was nervous standing here. And this, I've done thousands of presentations and conversations and, but when I think about standing at a stage where Angela Davis and Shakti Butler stood at, I think about standing at a stage where Erica Huggins and Tim West have, I mean, Wise has stood at. And individuals who tireless, tirelessly give up their lives in some cases with, and in some cases their bodies. There's something about being black in America, there's an improvisational spirit that we maintain. One way or another, we're going to make it happen. But I sit back and I think about why it is that Sister Gina and Sister Sharon and Brother Morris invited a young man like me who grew up on the south side of Chicago on Church Street, watched numbers of his friends become victim to crime and violence, and homes disrupted by misguided principals and under-engaged community members, to be real. I don't know how I made it here. I, I, I think about growing up and my mama sending me to St. Gerard Magella in the south suburb saying, Jay, I want to get you out the hood and go into a nice neighborhood with a nice school with nice priests and nice nuns. And but by fourth grade, they threw me out of there. I don't have to tell some of you that what it's like for a 10-year-old to feel like an outcast. So I moved back to the city and went to St. Jude Thaddeus, a, a black grammar school on the south side, right across from Jeremiah Wright's church on 95th Street. I figured here, clearly, I'm safe. I'm a, among my brothers and sisters on the 95th Street. But I had a sister, Frances Nadalny, who every month was on my back and I was suspended and suspended and suspended and driven to a state of consciousness where I felt that the structure of this institution was just not for a brother like me. And I was ready at that moment to give it up, to hang out with my friends, to possibly join a gang, to involve myself in street acts. Activity, but there was a man named John Collins who was a priest who just passed in November, God rest his soul, stepped in and didn't allow little knucklehead Julius to fall under. I, I, I'm not sure why it is that 
I'm here, but I know when I went to Quigley South High School and I got thrown out of there and people like, like Father Michael Flager and people like Jesse Jackson stood, it, stood up for me at 15 and said, we're not going to let that little boy get thrown into the street. I don't know what story I can give you at this very moment, but I know that the work that you do on a daily basis with individuals who institutions and cultures have rendered invisible, whose voices have been suppressed, and when they attempt to articulate a sense of hatred, a sense of self-loathing, then, then, then the ways in which they articulate that is not good enough. So I'm just proud to be here on June 20th, standing in a room full of folk who lay down their lives on a daily basis, who stands up against systems and cities and administrators who said, no, 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 we need to correct these folk. And you said, no, we need to heal these folk. No, we need to push them folk aside. And you say, no, we need to gather these folk up. And this tension. And so, as I thank you for allowing me to give a few words, I'm just going to, Brother Jenkins, I don't know who Hip Hop George was. <laughs> he may have been a cousin of Hip Hop Harry, you know. <laughs> but I'm reminded of what the Canadian-born rapper Drake says. When he says, I, I started from the bottom, but now I'm here. And the reality of it, not, the eye is not a personal eye. It's a transpersonal eye for all you theologians in the room. The eye isn't just me. I may have started from the bottom, but there's people like me all over the nation in which you engage yourselves with. And so the second line of that Drake chorus is, my whole team is here. And the work that you do across the country is teamwork, is group work, is fundamental business that allows for a community to restore itself in the face of the bombardment of people who render individuals within your community as voiceless and invisible. I'm not going to have it. I can't be a part of a system that, 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 that dehumanizes and deracinates individuals from the very linkages of their mama. So I'm proud to be among you at this very moment. And I know wholeheartedly that we stand here as men and women engaged in a system that would otherwise consider our young people dead. And so if anything comes in these next 35 or 40 minutes, I'm going to ask you to remember these words. And that is that I, I have a responsibility to heal the affected. And it's not just you, but there's people that's streaming across the country. There's Twitters going on right now. I put it on my Facebook and Twitter. He put it on his Facebook and Twitter. That my, my great university in Winburg University in Springfield right now is tweeting it and having a conversation because they know the nation right now needs to hear from you. The nation needs to hear at a time in which schools are closing in Detroit and Chicago and Philadelphia and, and all of a sudden now they're trying to bring folk together in communities but they're not doing it with the restorative practices that you have. That is going to draw lines and say, come on in. But they haven't gone through a process. You want me to go to a school of a gang banger who killed my brother? And I'm supposed to sit up here and learn math from this? I got stuff that I got to deal with. And mayors have to engage people like you because it is you who deal with the stuff that administrators are afraid to deal with. That maybe you say, well, Dr. Bailey, that's being too cruel. That, 
They got a lot on their plate. I know Brother Jenkins is about to be administrator, so God bless you, <laughs> brother. <laughs> Just understand that I don't know what your, how your religious persuasion is, brother, but there is always somebody higher than you. And I, know, I didn't mean that to be funny, because I don't, I mean, I know the brother's a good brother, but, but there are many, and again, there may be some people in this room, if we do, like little Wayne say, take inventory in our merry moments. There be folk in this room who figure, who renders themselves bigger than they actually are. So I'm reminded of, I'm a teacher, you know, I teach at Wittenberg University, the great institution in, in Springfield, Ohio. I'm proud to be a product of that the Department of Philosophy, a Department of Philosophy who in the last two and a half years have engaged in programs like Inside Out, and we in, in, engage ourselves in the Springfield um, a community with Clark County, and we, uh, and we bring philosophy to them, but we realize that what it is as a discipline that we do is what all of us do on a daily life. So we can have the prescripts, we know the people, we know the concepts, but these young people have axiology all in them. They got metaphysical concepts. They got theoretical paradigms. They have all the justice and, and th they have it all in themselves, but they need some of us to listen. So I'm proud to be a part of the Department of Philosophy where my chair, Nancy McHugh, who's been doing gallant work attempting uh, to push through the systems and structures of, of the city to ensure that we take ownership in the lives of young people. Adam there, he's, here, I mean, he's my TA, and he took all type of courses and classes and programs. And, and one thing we talk about all the time is the young people he talks to and how they realize so thankful for this program because finally someone is listening to them. And we get mad, trust me, I'm mad too. I'm not a hip hop head, let me get that clear. Now, Brother Morris, what that means is, is that I'm down with the temptations too. <laughs> you know, I, God gave me a human nature and I'm looking for my girl also, you know. <laughs> Cause ain't nothing nobody can say can take me away. <laughs> For my girl. <laughs> but, 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 but it doesn't stop there, right? Because the reality is, is that when we engage ourselves in the musics of a people, and here we are dealing with racial justice, and, and yes, I am a black man, if y'all couldn't tell in the back. I know y'all can tell I'm a big dude, like that's a big dude up there. <laughs> Whatever he say, I'm going to say yes, just in case, you know. <laughs> just in case he ain't made it to restore the practices 201, you know. <laughs> but I, I'm a black man, and, and, and the interesting thing is that when I, even on my campus, I love it, but the, the interesting thing is that people, who, people want to have conversations of, of transracial or, 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 or issues of non-racial or greatly post-racial conversations. And so individuals who rise themselves away from their, 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 relatively, their relative uh, race, if you will, or in the, in the case of a Tiger Woods or Barack Obama, individuals trying to have conversations, well, well he's, you know, this is a post-racial America. And campus is attempting to fuse a diversity and lose sight of individuality. I say, hold up, hold up, oh dear, wait a minute. I appreciate folk who think I'm a good man. I appreciate folk who think I'm a good teacher. I appreciate folk who think I'm a good lover. I think about folk who think I'm a good a speaker, but I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that I'm a black man, that I'm a black man, a black professor, and I'm a black professor and a black lover, and I'm a black lover and a black friend, and, and there's something about the historic racial consciousness that I bring to my conversations that I don't want you to ignore. You sit on your perch of post-raciality and lose sight of the fact that we are dealing with an America that has been, uh, that, that has been uniformly violent. 
with black, brown, and red folk across America. We can't excuse that. We can't ignore that. We can't let that go, even in 2013. You, we, you, you say, well, we got your LeBron Jameses. You got your Obamas. You got, but the reality is, if we're listening to these folk, what did Barack Obama say last week? To, he told the young people, look, y'all need to get y'all act together. Michelle Obama told Fucker Bowie State, look, y'all need to stop aspiring to be singers and ballers. You need to be lawyers. How come I can't be both? <laughs> you chilling with Beyonce, what you say? You don't want no more Beyonce's in the world who gives life to people? Now, there are people who listen who know I'm a Beyonce hater, so let me just put that out there. But in the spirit of Tim Wise, I'm a hater not because I'm invested in her, but the fact that I can't seem to navigate my, uh, my love for Kelly Rowland and my love for Beyonce. So I have to <laughs> love Kelly and hate the other. Yeah. Maybe we can have a restorative circle and y'all help me to get. <laughs> but Kelly is my motivation. If you're over 40, that's a song, guys. That's a song. That's a song. Guys. But we can't ignore the very fact that what comes out of the voices of people at its best, not its worst. Now, you mentioned Waka Faka. He got some, 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 some bad stuff out there. Now, I'm, I'm going to be real about that. I mean bad. I'm not making a, a, a question of, 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 of moral bad. I'm just saying it's, it just don't sound like nothing. But again, we can't lose sight of even Waka Flocka, who's, who, who's a, it's a party, it's a party. I represent Grove Street. What does that mean? He's trying to situate himself within a space, a community, because for that young brother, hater, not the trap was the one that raised him. So even the voices that come out of the trap needs to be understood, and you all in the room know that, but our systems don't recognize that. That we can hate the sin but love the sinner, as the, the Bible tells us, right? So all of y'all can tweet and talk about Jesus all you want. And whether or not there's a conversation out there, is hip-hop blasphemous, is hip-hop devilish, what's going on in that? All I have to ask you is whether or not some of your pastors are devilish. Don't automatically cast it off on young people attempting to gain voice and gain and, 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 and a, a, a sense of stability in an unstable war when in fact you, your cousin and your mama and your uncles and some of your pastors too are engaged in the same type of materialistic vanity that these hip hop folk are involved in. So I don't want to hear it. If you ain't out there with the restorative justice folk, I'm just being real. And I don't mean to step on y'all pastors and y'all rabbis and y'all bishops, but pray for me, no question, but why don't you work with me too? These communities need love. These people need attention. These circles need to be filled, not need to be talked about and demonized and creating senses of, dis of disarray and detachment. So you say, well, Dr. Bailey, don't be challenging a church. I said, look, I got a master's degree in theology. I almost was a priest for a minute until I started liking girls too much. <laughs> so don't, let's be real about that. I can't serve two masters, you know. I, <laughs> Al Pacino say the sin of a woman, I got to have that over the myrrh and the frankincense, you know, some, sometimes. But the reality is, though, sorry about this. Folk over 68 feeling that, I'm sorry. I started from the bottom, now I'm here. The reality is that there's a music of the people that define the very soul of who they are. And so I say all that to say, you know, but the thing is that, 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 that the reality is that, you know, the, the, um, 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 the beauty of, of the Motown sound was that it came organically a part of a Detroit system and individuals who, who recognize the very uh, uh, visceral realities of who they are. And so, so whether it's in Chicago or whether it's in Philly or whether it's in Detroit, the musics that guided you 
is not unlike the music that guides some of the folk under 40. He said, yeah, you see. See, I'm like, yeah, yeah, but it's a whole bunch of cussing going on. It's a whole bunch of sexist activity going on. I said, yeah, I said, but you know, I, I know a little bit thing about the blues, you know, and those of you who are over 40 know about the blues, you know, that it was a whole bunch of cussing going on. And if we wasn't on TV, I'd, I'd quote some things, but I don't know how much your lag is. <laughs> but it was a whole bunch of sexual activity going on, eh? ask Bessie Smith, ask Marvin Cease. Ask Billie Holiday. So you get mad at Nicki Minaj, but you don't get mad at Billie Holiday? Because you're so caught up in a strange fruit kind of analysis that you lose sight on the fact that she wants something deeper that flows between, well, excuse me, y'all know what I'm saying. <laughs> All I'm saying is we can't lose sight on the voices of people and hip hop is one of those voices. Now, as a community, we have to judge it and judge it not in the sense of, uh, of correcting it, but judge it in a sense, again, what we do, let folk know how this affects me. So we need to train and teach our young women. I got a six-year-old daughter. I'm ready now to train and teach her. Don't get caught up with the brothers that walking around with the bling bling and walking around with the gold in their mouth representing something that they're not. These are all accoutrements. These are all dress-ups to hide the very pain and the very hurt that these young men and young women have experienced in traps and barrios and neighborhoods across the country in part because we haven't, not you, but we as America haven't put enough time in. So if I can't get the love of my mama, I get the love of my Bentley. They say, well, Jasmine Sullivan said, I bust the windows out of this car. Some of y'all say, why, why would you do that? You're going to jail. Because I know that that car will get his attention. That his values is caught up in stuff and not in people. And the great work about what we do in restorative practice is that we're concerned about how do we bring back the values of people. I need to know what bothers you, sister, what caused you to make a decision, and they need to hear what it was that, 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 that how it affected them. And I don't need to tell none of y'all the numbers. Y'all know the numbers. Y'all know how it works in corrections. I spend, uh, for the last 12 years, I, I, I do about 30 to 40 prisons annually. I go in there, and I tell them, I said, you know, you know wardens, they, I always want to talk to me. If his warden's in the house, I appreciate you. God bless you. And you're part of a system that I just got to, you know, you know, we just got to keep praying for you, brothers and sisters. But the inmates always ask me, Dr. Bailey, we, we saw you on CNN, we saw you on BT, we, we saw, why, why, why are you here? And sometimes when I'm asked that question, it, now it's a little bit easier, but 18 years ago it was difficult for me to answer that question. I said, I'm here for two reasons. One I'm here for because the reality is that every day that I walk on this earth, I'm one decision away from being here with you, with my PhD. And so for me, you aren't estranged from who I am. For me, you're not something other than a product in which I represent. That's not who you are. For me, you're a representation that I need to make sure that when you are out of this institution, God willing. You are prepared to be a part of a community that is prepared for you. Those are two things. Some of us do the inside work. And some of us do the outside work. But we in this room got to do the inside and the outside work. So the goody mob calls it cell therapy. And so young men and women across the country are becoming acclimated to, prison, to the prison industrial complex. 
They're getting used to it. I can do that time. I can take that next bid. I can, I, I, I do the math. I do the cost. If I get caught with this, I got that. They, they sitting up here making epistemological judgments and saying, you know what? Based on this empirical analysis, if I get caught, I can do those five years. Because again, they're making value judgments on something other than community. And so they've created a sense of a shell, if you will. So I, I go in the church, I say, look, I know everybody in this room and here, I said, I do about 30 or 40 a year. Oftentimes they, they increase in size, increase in scope. So look, I'm not here, I don't, I don't have four steps to nothing. I don't, have, I don't have 10 steps to nothing. But one thing I'm concerned about is I, I'm going to see y'all when y'all get out. I don't hide. I'm going to see you at the park. I'm going to see you in the communities. I'm going to see you at the Chicago Fest. I'm going to see you at the Gospel Fest. I'm going to see you at the county fair. I want to know when I see you that I'm not afraid of you. And there are people, just by virtue of what, just by the stamp of being an ex-offender, they are afraid of you. And the only way that I can assure myself I'm not afraid of you is to engage every moment that I have in conversations that attempt to make you realize the very thing that institutions like this try to get you to forget, and that is the God within you is bigger than the structures that are opposed against you. So I always tell them a story like this. I say, look, back in the year 2006, it's a real story, I was shopping, I was doing a Black History Month speech in Virginia, and I was shopping at Victoria's Secret. I'll let that marinate for a minute. Uh, there was a CNN special last week that some of y'all saw that I'll let y'all kind of soak that up for a minute. I was shopping at Victoria's Secret's not for me. They don't have three X's in Victoria's. Okay, 4X, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> they don't have that in Victoria's Secrets. I was shopping for a young woman. I wanted to do something nice for Valentine's Day, so I went to Victoria's Secrets because I knew her, her, her favorite stuff was strawberry bath beads. So here I am in Falls Church, Virginia at the mall, and looking around, see who looking at me, because remember, I'm. A, Product of the hood, I'm trying to, you know. I'm, I'm like old school Maxwell, I always feel like somebody's watching me. <laughs> now if you're under 40, you don't know what the heck I just said. You know. <laughs> but I'm in there and I grabbed and I saw the bath beads was in the back. I was hoping to be right in the front and get in, get out, get on out, nobody sees me. Dr. Bain, no, 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 that's, that's my brother, you know. Chris Paul versus Chris Small, whatever the other day, you know. <laughs> I grabbed the bath beads and the line got longer. And this story, I tell the inmates, I tell you guys, I got, the, 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 the line got longer and I was really worried about what people thought of me. What, what is that dude doing up in the. Everybody in the room was sisters. hiding in the back, waiting for the line to clear. And I asked one of the helpers, do you need some help? I said, yeah, can you do me a favor? Here's the money. Can you just pay for it for me and meet me out in the hallway? <laughs> so I'll be standing in line and fucking looking at me half curiously and asking Du Boisian questions like, how does it feel to be a problem? You know, that, that kind of thing. I didn't want to get there, so I said, well, no, you can stand in line. So I sat in line, and I, I kept my head down, and I was reading the bag of bath beads. <laughs> now, I'm a philosopher, remember, to keep it in the back of your mind. I'm a philosopher. I'm a philosopher. So I was reading the bath beads, literally, not figuratively. I was reading it line for line, and there's instructions on the bath beads. And so I was reading the instructions, and the first instruction on the bath beads says, shake package vigorously. So I started thinking to myself, you know, if, if I was a bath bead, What would I think about being shaken vigorously? 
Then the next line says, tear open the package. And I'm like, I'm good. Don't be tearing me open. Uh, let me chill what I'm doing in my package. You know, you shook me up already. Why you want to tear me open? Don't do that. The third line of the bath bead says, pour under hot water. So now my philosophical sensibilities are picking up on whoever made the instructions of this bath bead. And I said, you know, I think the makers of this bath bead might have had some a restorative justice training. I said, because the reality is, is that after you're poured, after you're poured into hot water, it says, leave the room for 10 minutes. I always tell ex-offenders and those who are in the system, I said, look, I don't know what it's like. I've been arrested every now and then, but I'm always let out. I, I work with Reverend Jackson. You work with Reverend Jackson, you're you going to get arrested. You know, and, you know. Google me and the, and the Decatur Seven Institute in, you know, in 1999 when I was a spokesperson for education getting thrown out of the city. Macon County, Illinois, telling me, and, and, and Millican University, I can say it now because the gag order is over. The city, the school, everybody, you need to get out the city. You didn't cause racial strife up in the city. I said, what did I do? I put a pause on my Victoria's Secret story. I'm getting back. Because <laughs> I'm mad now. I just thought about it. You want me to be silent as school boards throw out eight young boys, 14 to 18, for two years in school? And you just want somebody like me? Again, you heard the story, but the city heard the story, the state heard the story, CNN, Fox, Nightline, they heard the story. I was three days fighting with Sean Hannity because he heard the story. I said, I'm not going to allow you to render them young boys as irredeemable. You're going to throw 16 year olds in the street for two years for a fight at a football game. Wasn't no bats, wasn't no bottles, wasn't no knives, wasn't no, wasn't no, no it was just scrapping. Not, not, to, not to say nothing, you know, it was right to fight. But I'm, a, I'm a Blackhawks fan. They've been, they need to fight some more to win this Stanley Cup. They're <laughs> they letting. They're letting the Bruins fight all over them right now, but I, I digress again. I, <laughs> I'm not going to allow you to tell me that I can't fight for these young people when I know, I know my story. And some of y'all in this room are involved in corrections, involved in working with individuals so that they won't get into that pipeline because you were a part of that story. You were the ones that were thrown out in eighth grade or thrown out of high school, and somebody stepped in. I told you that. Somebody stepped in for my life, and so you're going to tell me that I'm not going to, that I'm going to just allow a city to throw away eight young black lives? and not have a, butchering, a, 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 a buttressing apparatus to uphold them but the criminal justice system. And we know it all too often. You take them out for two years, they ain't going back. So I was willing to die. And literally, if you, I went on a hunger strike for about two, three hours. And, <laughs> I don't know what y'all laughing about. Y'all trip. <laughs> what y'all trying to say? I can't. <laughs> but I did, though. It's, 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 leave me Google it. Julius Betty hunger strike. It'll tell you. And the reality is, is that here we go. Reverend Jackson called me quickly from Chicago. Boy, take your, get your butt to McDonald's somewhere. <laughs> well, you're not making the news for hunger, hunger strikes. We ain't, we ain't doing that. But when all said and done, you got a school board who said, I am exercising home rule, and then these kids are getting thrown out for two years. You got the state of Illinois uh, um, 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 Department of Education who says, no, you got to let these boys back in school. The school board said, you can't tell me nothing. I'm going to keep these kids out for two years. They told the state, I ain't thinking about you. They told the governor. 
the school board. Eight people who have to go to eight churches, who have to listen to eight pastors, who somehow you got pastors telling them it's okay to throw these little Negro boys out for two years. Where they're saying, hip, I'm keeping this real. I'm not new to this. I'm true to this. I may not be as good as what I do as some of you great giants and taller and stalwart uh, giants are, but I know very well that I'm willing to die, too, for individuals who have been rendered invisible trying to create voice in America that attempts to, 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 to send truth to power. That's all I'm doing. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to fashion myself off with a PhD as if I'm something different than those who ain't got no D's. Or maybe all D's. <laughs> Throw some D's on it. Over 40 just hit the footnotes in my speech. Yes. So back to my story, yeah? I, I, I just wanted to kind of put that in there because my brother Morris had forgot my bio. He would have spit all that to you, but he forgot that. He would have told you that I started from the bottom. But now I'm here. So I, told, I, I, I tell folk all the time who are wrestling with these questions of self-worth and, 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 and who are dealing with issues that people, even people of power, tell them that they're not worth anything but this space. I tell him, I say, imagine yourself with the bath bead. I said, many of you young brothers and sisters that on one day was chilling in your proverbial package in Toledo and Cleveland and Chicago and DC and Oakland. A shout out to Oakland and San Francisco in the house. <laughs> I bring you greetings from my brother in hip hop, Davey D. Uh, I'm sure he's listening right there, so I appreciate that brother for what he does. San Francisco State University and the kind of great work that they do um, with black studies and the oldest black studies institute, uh, a department in the country and great individuals who are friends of mine who do work there. But anyway, I, I know that cities like Oakland and San Francisco, one day y'all was chilling in your proverbial packages. And somebody rolled up on you and shook your package. And they locked you up and put you in the county system. And, and somebody put on the gloves and tore open your package. And then they put you through months and years of the hot waters of the correctional system. And they left, they shut you in and locked the jail cell and put you in there for five years, for 10 years, and 12 years, just like the bath bead, whose package was torn, whose was put in the hot water, who was left alone in the hot water. But I always tell people, I said, look, if you follow the bath bead's instructions, after the 10 minutes of hell, if you will, Bath Beast tells you to open the door and be of therapy to others. And so for whoever it is, for young folk I engage with who may not be in the system yet, who are just sitting up there randomly looking in classes and trying to figure out what their purpose is, trying to figure out some type of existential meaning in a chaotic and absurd world, I say, wait a minute, what are your hot water experiences? That's restorative practices. What brought you to the point that we're in this circle today? But recognizing that at the end of this circle, at the end of that practice, at the end of that term, at the end of 10 minutes, your job is not to sit up in the hot water and wallow away. Your job is to open the door and be of service to somebody. 
But the only way we can ex expect individuals whose structures bigger than some of us have, have pushed aside to be of service to anybody is for us, like what you do daily, is to engage our lives in the restoration of hope and the restoration of values and the realization that these mirrors, little Wayne say, mirror on the wall, here we are again. Through my rise and fall, you would be my only friend. Tell me that you can understand the man I am. So why are we here fighting with each other again? That type of understanding that mirror moments are those relationships. Mere moments are times that we, and what we do, but what we do when people, we have to make themselves accountable. And so you need to look at that mirror. And we can't let even President Obama, we can't let him or our darling First Lady, uh, um, uh, Michelle, we can't let them get away of trying to make America look good in a broken mirror. You want to look at my cell phones? And you want to have your NSA director stand up and say, but look, in this process, we found 12 terrorists. I even look good in a broken mirror. You want to authorize drones? You don't want to close Guantanamo, but baby, because in part, you are afraid of what you might look like. I might look weak, but yet you question the very hood boys or hood girls who themselves say, I must operate with a vision of imperialism because I get it from my mama. So I ask you, I know you're fired up, ready to go. We all are fired up, ready to go, but I ask you, as we bring this to a little bit of close, I ask you to, to think about Shakespeare's Hamlet. Y'all yeah, say, damn, how the hell he get from? <laughs> Lil Wayne and Duro and Young Jeezy and rapper George, Hip Hop George. <laughs> Somebody got to email me who the hell Hip Hop George is. But he might be the, you know, the, hot, the hotness from Toledo. But in the fourth act of Hamlet's, of Shakespeare's Hamlet, Shakespeare is, I mean, Hamlet is, was called by King Claudius and was trying to figure out what was going on. Trying to wonder where is Polinius? Where's he at? Shakespeare told him, he said, you know what? He's dining right now. He's had supper. He's eating? I've, I've been calling for him. What do you mean he's eating? I'm the king, don't you know? <coughs> well, he's not quite eating himself. He is the one being eaten. So Claudius is saying, hmm? And so the line you see on your board right there is, that is exactly what Hamlet told the king. He says, look, man, the reality is, is that, look, if, if a man may fish with the worm that have eat of a king, that has eaten of the fish that had eaten the worm. A man may fish, again, I'm gonna teach you now real quickly. A man may fish with the worm that have eat of the king and eat at the fish that hath fed the worm. Now that came about three or four pages before this conversation at the cemetery. 
I, I like to talk about death a lot, not because I'm druid and dark, but because I realize that that is a level of certainty that I must recognize awaits me very soon. And that level of a certainty is to ask myself what it is that I'm supposed to do before that moment comes. Now, we all know no man knows, no woman knows the day of the hour. So the question I always tell people, look, if you, if, you know, if you can quote that you don't know the day or the hour, but yet you recognize that you're not ready to die, then what are you saying? I, like, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand. I said, like, well, look, look at what Hamlet is saying. If you work backwards, is that there, there are some kings in this world who will live and who will die. And there are some paupers in the world that all they do is fish. And they will live and they will die. And so in Act 4 of Shakespeare's Hamlet, they, they're at the cemetery talking to the grave digger. They're trying to figure out why it is what goes on in this cemetery? And Hamlet is having a conversation with the grave digger, like, whose grave is this? And whose grave is that? And the grave digger was, was kind of funny sometimes, what well, is my grave because I'm digging it. Said, well, whose skull is this? Well, it, it could be the skull of Julius Caesar. Because his skull is here somewhere. It could be the skull of Alexander the Great. Because his skull is in there too. Or it could be the skull of your late servant to the king. Bottom line, we all in the same grave. And so when people ask me, I, 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 I said, Bailey, you, you went to Howard, you went to Harvard, you all these degrees, how do you hang out in the hood? How do you have these conversations? Why do you, I'll say, what, look, 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 what, is the, what does that mean at the end of the day? Because I recognize that my job is to feed folk. And the question is, we all are our feeders. We all give of others. We all give to others. But the question is, what is it that we give to others? We all got food to give. Some of the food is nourishing, and some of the food is devouring. But the reality is, is that we are all a part of a human system. So Hamlet says, look, the king can treat the pauper like garbage. And when the king dies, the worms take part of the king's experience eats the king up, and then somebody then grabs a little fat squibbly thing and put it on a hook and throws that worm that had just ate the king into the waters and catches a fish who eats the worm who ate the king. And we just ate the fish who ate the worm ate the king. This may sound like a fourth grade nursery rhyme, but because <laughs> there was an old lady who swallowed a fly. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't know why. <laughs> Not perhaps she gonna die. <laughs> But the question becomes is, if I know that everything I put out in the world is going to actually come back to me, why isn't I, why aren't I putting out good food? Right. So all across America right now, my great institution of Winburg University, thank you for bringing me along with my family and my friends, and my Twitter folk, my hip hop heads, I got to give a shout out. Folk wouldn't, my folk would be mad if I didn't give shouts out. I, I, I do have a, a book that came out in 2011 um, called Essays on Hip Hop's Philosopher King on Jay-Z. 
Uh, that is out, but that's, 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 that's old stuff. You can get it if you don't have it. That's old stuff, especially nowadays that he's making news everywhere. Got press conferences going to Cuba, stuff like that, that kind of thing. But, but we're working on two projects now. We have, they'll be out in February. One is the essays on Kanye West, a, phen a phenomenal conversation that we're engaged in the type of questions that really push uh, uh, this question of what it means to be a, a public image and what that public image represents when it comes to truth. And I'm not one to tell you, and I'm here to tell you, everybody who listens to rap music or, or watch break dances or listen to uh, 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 DJs. I'm here to tell you, look, 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 some of that stuff is image. And, but, the, but, but the image tells a story. And there's nothing more different than, 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 I don't know what truth is. Again, I'm an existentialist philosophically, so I'm still un, unknown what truth is. I grew up as a Christian, so the only truth I know is Jesus. And so everything after that, I'm not sure about. So if, in fact, we are clear, and, and yes, Jesus is not the same as Jesus. And if you're under 40 and ain't got the album on Tuesday, that's the name of Kanye West's new album. And so I was in a big beef the other day with two pastors who want to automatically demonize Kanye West and says, he's a demon. He's a, how dare he blaspheme the name of God? I said, look, I, I don't know what song you're listening to, but that's not what comes out of that song. So the second line of the song is, I am a God. I'm a child of God. I'm under the hand of God. And you're going to demonize it? It's the same thing you tell your parishioners every week. I am God. I am a child of God. We sing at the altars, restore me, renew me, make me whole, make me new. Well, then why are we questioning when we elevate ourselves? Because we are new. So I have that book coming out, then I have another, uh, at the same time we got, at the same daggone time, at the same daggone time, we got another project coming out on uh, ruminations of hip hop as philosophical form that's coming out uh, in January also. So I have two projects coming out in January, but I, I, I said what to say is that yes, I, I'm a philosopher though, and trained in theology, listen to music of all kinds. You all know you can take away I'm a Kelly Rowland fan. She is my wife. And what exists in my mind is better than what exists in reality. <laughs> Unless you're man tail then it becomes problematic to a people that they don't understand vision. <laughs> y'all sitting up there acting like y'all ain't never dreamed about having that man, that woman that, 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 that completes you, that makes you whole. I'm not saying that's true. I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying y'all you, you, going to act like y'all ain't never dreamed about her. Confidence says, keep it real. Because some of us have dreamed about a perfect society, has dreamed about a place that allows for justice to take care of its citizens and a democratic voice to represent the best of who we are. But for some of us, that dream hasn't come into fruition, but you're working on it, you're working toward it. And so as I close this conversation, I want some of us to remember that I grew up a grandson of a Baptist minister through Catholic schools all my life, two Catholic high schools, and after both of them threw me out, I ended up going to a great high school, Thornwood High School in Chicago, and outside of Chicago. But I was always fascinated by the biblical story of Lazarus. Something about the Lazarus story that always caught my attention. Now those of you who don't know the story, I'm going to say it in three minutes, get on out the door so we can ask questions and y'all can move on and we can hit the hip hop panel later on. But I'm going to say this in my own way because I'm, I'm, I'm not an ordained minister, I'm just. But Mary called on the cell phone, Jesus. She didn't know that Obama and the injustice system was listening in. <laughs> she called Jesus and she said, Jesus, not Jesus, she said, Jesus, your beloved is sick and needs your attention. 
Jesus, you know, he says, I'll be there. But just like most of us who our kid is sick, our, our child is sick, our loved one is sick, we want help to be there right then and there. But Jesus ain't have no Learjet at the time. He, he wasn't a baller like Jay-Z. <laughs> Jesus got there when he could. And when he got down the road, because, you know, he, he rolled with all his boys, you know. Jesus had, had a posse that rolled. <laughs> there were some theological goons, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> You know, they weren't wanksters, they were spiritual gangsters, you know what I'm saying? They, they were true to this, they weren't new to this, you know what I'm saying? So they rode with Jesus through the, over the rivers and through the woods, past Grandma House and everybody else. They, they arrived on the road where Lazarus and the family and Mary them were. Mary come running down, all hysterical. Jesus, Jesus, you're too late. He's died. I can imagine if Jesus was anything like me, because my name do start with a J and end with S. If he was anything like me, Jesus would say, look, look, I didn't walk all these miles, all these days. Can, 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 I, can I get some Kool-Aid first before all this? I mean, can a brother get some water? I mean, you come in with all this, you know, talking all this raspy stuff, trying to ask me stuff, you know what I'm saying? Hip-hop reference, excuse me. <laughs> G -G Jesus, like, wait a minute. It's cool, I got this. He ain't sleep, he's just resting. And Mary's like, what the heck? I'm telling you, man, I've been here. I watched the man die. The man is sleeping. Jesus walked up to rise Lazarus and told him, rise, open your eyes, and live. And there's two things I want to leave you with, and if you can go back to the other one, it's, one is recognize that your impact should outlast your importance. And for some of us, again, I'm not speaking to you directly. We just had this conversation. Right. But many administrators flip that proverbial script. And they believe their importance supersedes their impact. And I'm just here to leave you with the idea of keeping your head that your impact shall last your importance. Why? Because again, Jesus didn't, Jesus wasn't there, and Mary and everybody else was waiting for Jesus to show up because they believed the only way this boy could have life was if Jesus showed up. So everybody put all their hopes on Jesus. And some of you got administrators who you're fighting with and, and school boards who you're fighting with and, and, and justice systems that you're fighting with and they are operating like the king and, and they've got mass of importance. But little impact. And so the reason I believe this is important, you can go back to the next slide, the reason I believe this is important is because the reality is when Jesus comes through, raises Lazarus, if you will, from the dead, he realized that what you're dealing with is not me, it's the impact of me. If I had sent my homie to do the same thing, y'all would have been all right with that too. You called on me, but yet the bottom line is that you wanted restoration. We're calling on mayors. We're calling on governors. We're calling on presidents. We're calling on senators. But what we really want might exist with me. We, 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 we have realized that people's importance does not supersede their impact, but the reverse is the case. So I'm a firm believer, like Jesus, at, at that day, he interrupted death. He interrupted death. 
And for many of us who do the work that we do, there are some dying and some spiritual and mental dying people in cities and states across this nation. And some of our leaders are calling on God to bless the flag and God to bless the United States of America. But you know, I, I hate to be selfish, but God, can you bless me another day so I can bless somebody else? God, can you just give me the push so that I can do my job? Because at the end of the day, when I die, I want somebody to cry at my funeral. I may not have a state funeral with the bugles bugling and the flags waving. I may not have that because my importance may not be that big, but I want to have folk at my casket crying. There lies Julius, whose impact was greater than his importance. There lies Sister Gina. There lies Sister Sharon. There lies all the volunteers of this, uh, 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 this great con uh, conference. There lies all of you whose impact was greater than your importance. Because, Brother Morris, you'll appreciate this, the, the song asked the question, when will there be a harvest for the world? And I'm, I'm a firm believer that harvests occur through work. And those of us in this room have done the work, but we, I, I don't know what it is that we, we, we need, but we have to focus in on being interrupters. We need the same thing that Jesus did with, with Lazarus. We need to interrupt. We need to know that when school systems are closing, we need to be interrupters of death. When, 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 when organizations aren't hiring, we need to be interrupters of death. When psychic violence have taken over the minds and hearts of people, we need to be the interrupters of death. When, when heteronormative, when, when when heteronormativity is affecting the, 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 the realities of men and women, we need to be the interrupters of death when sexism and homophobia is affecting our communities. We need to be the interrupters of death because there's sadness in this world, there's helplessness in this world, and we need to be in harvest for this world. And so I appreciate the invitation that I was given to be a part of this great body of people who across, across this nation, all of you, have more impact than importance. And I just encourage you to stand strong in that impact. Recognize that that is what carries truth. That is what carries, has residual effect because we all want a better world and we know that some of us are dealing with messed up individuals and messed up situations and messed up men with messed up women create messed up children and these messed up children be going to these schools and these churches and creating messed up schools and messed up churches and these messed up churches and schools who find themselves as beacons of light to a community find themselves in, in, inhabited by messed up children who were parented by messed up parents who, who didn't understand, who didn't go to the restoration process. You think that you got over the fact that you was molested as a child. You think you a man, I heard a sister say the other day, you think you a man because some woman gave you fellatio at the age of eight. You've been affected. And his false sense of masculine bravado infects the way in which I operate with my sisters, let alone with how I raise my young brothers. So women become objects instead of subjects. And I can beat and slap and hurt and murk and, and not feel the impact that it has, but we circle them up. Our job is to circle them up because we who seek a better world 
have decided that in our mere moments that we want to be better people. And better people make better decisions. And better decisions create better progenies. And better progenies inhabit better communities. And better communities create better states with better countries. So when will there be a harvest for the world? Or when all of us recognize and look in the mirror recognize what beauty our true seed is and sow that seed of fruit in lives of others. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We're going to try to let him go and I'm going to tell him to come to your session.